Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Weekly Poker Showdown, brought to you by Party Poker. I am your host, Jamie Staples. This week on the podcast, we have Joseph Sumanik, another fellow Party Poker team pro uh, that is out there on the felt and always getting after it. Three bet me all the time. I don't know about it, man, but I had a great conversation with him uh, about playing poker professionally and how he got into the game, transitioning from handball, handball and playing that uh, semi-professionally. So really interesting to hear sort of his story in life and get to know uh, about this player because I'd never met him before. So uh, it's a great interview. I think you're going to enjoy it. But before we get to that, let's talk about some of the online poker news this week. <laughs> We're going to start off with some of the party poker news this week, and we've got to talk about the WPT. The mini and the micro main events are starting this Sunday. Now, the first thing you need to know, this Saturday, the 29th, is the first day of the micro main event. That's a $109 buy-in, $1 million guarantee. So you have a flight on Saturday and Sunday for that event. Make sure you get there. And the second thing is the mini main event, the $1,000 buy-in, $5 million guarantee starts on Sunday. That is day 1A. If you can't afford the, the buy-in for that, the $1,000, you have plenty of opportunities to get in cheaper on a satellite. There's a huge one going on on Saturday. So it's a $33 buy-in, and it's guaranteed 100 seats into the 1K. That's right, $33 into 1K, 100 seats guaranteed. It's gonna be the best value satellite ever. I can guarantee it. Sorry, Party Poker, you're not hitting that guarantee. It's not happening. It's not happening. You're not getting there, which means there's going to be some nice, juicy, dead money in the prize pool. That's my prediction. Get out there, play that satellite on Saturday, and of course, the uh, the mini main event, day 1A, on Sunday. The following, day 1B, is the following Sunday, so uh, we are into the main event times here in this WPT series. Wednesday, we've got the Heads Up uh, Championship going on, $3,200 buy-in. So um, it's going to be a pretty remarkable week. I'm really excited about what's to come. Um, over the next 10 days or so. So with the WPT World Online Championships, there's leaderboards going on, and there's also 100,000 still available to win in these leaderboards. And if any of the Team Pro or the Team Online happen to win, we're going to give it back to players. We don't get to keep it, right? We're going to give it back to players, and we are going to host a free roll held in their name, uh, and the players will take the leaderboard prize and the free roll for players to win. There will also be bounty prizes, which I think is a great idea, because listen, we, we're already sponsored, right? We already got some upside. The leaderboard prizes, throw it back to the players. I like it. I'm in support, so I'm going to do my best, everyone listening to this podcast, to get on that leaderboard. Unfortunately, I, I think I only have maybe four day twos throughout the whole series so far, but this weekend's the one. I know it. The uh, micro main event, one million guaranteed. We're going to get it done, and we're going to get that... Uh, that free roll happening for you all, okay? So stay tuned for that. That's what's going on in the WPT this week. On to some live poker news now, and for the UK card rooms, they are starting to open once again. I saw Rob Young talking about this, um, owner of the Dust Dawn Casino. I saw him talking about this a little bit, doing some research uh, as to when he is going to open his room. Now, it is not open yet, as well as the four casinos owned by Aspers are yet to reopen, but... Some casinos have opened with the uh, with the dividers, the plexiglass dividers in between players. The Hippodrome Casino Poker Room opened last week, uh, and then also the Poker Room, formerly known as the Vic, confirmed it would be opening as Poker Room for cash games. Empire Poker Room also offering cash games. So interesting to see Poker Rooms back open here in the UK. Uh, I know we have a, a lot of listeners from the UK, so what do you guys think about this? Are you ready to go back and play live poker? Uh, or do you think it's too soon, or would you rather wait? I'd love to hear from you. You can tweet me at Jamie Staples uh, and give me your thoughts if you're so inclined. But of course, so much of the world is listening to this from around the world uh, where there's poker rooms open or closed or in various states of, of disarray with what's happening. But I wish poker players all the best. I hope you stay healthy. Uh, and if you're choosing to play, have a great time. Let's get on to the role of honor now and talk about some of the amazing results from this past week. And once again, reporting on Ike Haxton. Once again, won a second $25,000 super high roller this series, beating 20 other players to win $262,000. Ike, on top of the game, crushing it out there, Ike. Please help me, Ike. I want to be a better player. I need to learn from you, dude. Congratulations on the result. $10,000 high roller was won by Kale Burns for $85,000 this week. And Timothy Adams took the 5200 WPT high roller turbo for just over $61,000. 
the World Series of Poker side of things. Nick Mamone won his first bracelet for placing first in the $1,500 marathon for over 302000 The $500 deep stack was won by Anson Tang for more than 150 k And Toby Joyce came out on top in the $800 PLO to win $139,000. That's it for the online poker news this week. So without further ado, let's get into the conversation with Joseph Sumanik. Joining me on the podcast today, I have a fellow member of Party Poker Team Pro, Joseph Suminik. Joseph, thanks for taking the time. Hi, thanks for having me. I appreciate it, and uh, yeah, let's go. I, it, it's a pleasure to meet you, finally. I see you out there on the table all the time. I don't like seeing you on the table. I think you're a very good player. I do think you have an edge on me, but don't hold that over me. Um, so <laughs> to, to get to know you in the poker world a little bit... Take me, take me back. I want to understand your poker story to anyone out there that may not have heard it before. Oh, How did you get then, into uh, poker? Okay, then we have to go uh, back in time uh, for about uh, 20 years, I think. No, like 20 I'm years. Seven. Uh, yeah, I started like playing with friends when I was like 17, 18. Right. And uh, yeah, then like everyone else, I saw it on TV wanted to play i always uh, loved to play cards or games i started pretty early with chess like right. when i was four i think i played oh, wow. a lot of, okay. uh, with my brother and like in our family chess was pretty popular and yeah as i said i always loved to play games or especially cards and when i uh, started playing poker like everyone else i played like 10 euro tournaments uh, in the live casinos and mm tried to grind my way up and yeah i got lucky during the years so yeah. <laughs> this is around 2000 right so this is pre pre money maker that you're playing poker yeah yeah like i started pre money maker but money maker was also like wow okay this is yes like the dream you know his right. name chris money maker and then he wins uh, the biggest event uh, in the year so yeah, that was that gave everything a push as well. Myself too. So I understand you're you're from Austria. Did you grow up in Austria? And what what was poker like in in Austria during that time? Like before Money Maker, before it sort of blew up in America, did it have a, a culture and did it have a big following, or or was it kind of a fringe scene? Yeah, I, I would say so. Like it was more like a, a smaller scene, and uh, mm. nobody like I didn't have any friends which uh, were playing poker or like I didn't know anyone from playing poker. I was uh, playing handball at the time and that were like, that was my my community. But um, then we played with the handball players, you know, when you go and travel along bus drive, what you're going to do? Okay, we play poker. And uh, I thought always I had a really good feeling for, for the game, but because I just loved it to play it. So I was uh, very interested in it. and. Then I wanted to to try to make money with it because I saw okay other people uh, are making money with it uh, and I give it a try. But uh, what wasn't that easy as expected? <laughs> I was pretty young. Uh, I made uh, a lot of mixed mistakes, a lot of big mistakes, I would say, also right. financially. And uh, yeah, then at some point I don't know it made a click and then I started to uh, to hang out also with uh, more guys which are playing poker and. We sh shared our thoughts about the game. <clears throat> Sorry, and uh, yeah, then uh, at one point it happened to yeah just be my number one, my num number one hobby, and I wanted to do it for a living. And I gave it a try when I was twenty five. Right. So I quit my job. Uh, I still played handball, but uh, with about age of thirty, I realized okay, you cannot play poker for a living and play handball. Mm. And as, yeah, so I had to make a decision. It was a pretty hard decision, to be honest, for me, because handball was uh, my life. It's not that well paid in Austria, but yeah, it's, it's, if you love something uh, and it's your passion and do, you do it for 20 years, then it's just pretty hard to, to give it up. But um, yeah, I think I made the right choice to, to go for poker. Yeah, that's uh, that's quite a journey. And I think it's so interesting, the... I'm drawing some parallels. First of all, competing against your brother playing chess when you're younger. I don't know if you had a competitive sort of environment where you tried to beat them, you play against them or whatever, but I come from that environment as well, where we trying to, you know, my brother Matt, who is also on our team, he started with play money 
and he had more play money than me. And I was like, well, we can't let that. I'm the older brother. I need more play money, right? So uh, do you think that played a factor in, in like your ability um, to play semi-professional handball and then to become a professional poker player? Like, did that drive you forward? Like 100%. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm a pretty competitive person. Every game I play, I was a pretty bad loser. I had to learn to lose because uh, actually if you're playing uh, MTTs, you're losing uh, most of the time. A lot, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it just looks like everybody is just posting when he's winning, but nobody, you know, there are no stories. Hey, Shuzinho just lost uh, 50K in the last two months. Uh, you don't yeah. read that. You just read, uh, yeah, I had a nice cash there. But uh, yeah, I'm also like with handball. I, it was like um, we had a really good team, a really good handball team, like from, from 16 on. Uh, we were always competing in, in Austria to be the number one team. And I think that gave me also a, a, a good like background to, to be competitive in poker. I just wanted mm. to, I just want to win. It's, I don't know. It's not always about the money. Of course it is, but, uh, just being number one or like being on the top, uh, satisfies me a lot. What, what about now? What drives you now? And what's the split between the financial side of poker and and the other side of poker, the competitive. Like, what what goals do you have, and what pushes you forward now? I mean, I would like. I would say uh, the money is not an aspect. Of course, it is. Mm. I mean, if you're doing it for a living, you have to earn money uh, to just uh, live. You know. Yeah. But um, I see it more as a job right now or like through the last past years i mean i'm playing for such a long time and uh, i had to learn to to get to the point to say okay that's a uh, kind of a job you have to take it serious you cannot go drink the night before a big sunday session or something and uh, you have to make some sacrifices as well absolutely yeah um you touched on tilt a little bit there, being a passionate guy. Do you have any, do you have any fun like tilt stories through your poker career? You know, like where you blew up or you dusted off some stacks or what? Do you have something? Uh, actually, I think I have a lot, uh, <laughs> but I'm not the guy who like punches uh, his uh, laptop or throws it out of the window or something like that. I'm. Uh, I'm tilting still, to mm. be honest. Right. Uh, that's something I'm still uh, trying to learn about. But um, yeah, like nothing really fun. It's just more like sad that uh, I'm tilting that much because uh, I should know it better. It's right. just uh, sometimes it's it's a game of luck. A lot of luck is involved, especially in one poker tournament. And uh, most of the time it goes the other way. Because yeah, variance is is a big thing. So yeah, that's uh, that's for sure my my biggest my biggest thing I have to work on. Right. Okay. But also, I'm like, if I win, I, I have these emotions inside me that uh, gives me such a that nice feeling. So yeah, I I can like have really really good emotions and really bad emotions because I'm a pretty emotional guy. Right. And that's an interesting thing, I think, in, in poker, because it, it seems like the the aspiration is to be a cyborg of most of the new school is just like, don't let anything affect me because that is seen as a is a weakness. Do you think do you think it is or do you think your approach is better for for playing poker long term? Do you like having those emotional swings or would you prefer that you didn't feel? That's a good question. Uh... Oh, that's a really good question. Actually, probably it's better to don't feel it because uh, if you're playing MTTs, you're uh, like losing a lot of times. Mm. But it's just me. It's just like I have this these emotions inside me, and I think for me it's better to let them out if I'm happy mm. or if I'm unhappy. Um, like this tilt is better because it lasts like for ten seconds, and right. I'm focused again. Yeah. But if uh, <laughs> if I don't tilt and just like keep it, keep it, keep it, then uh, I'm afraid that uh, at one point it makes like bum and then, then maybe I would uh, throw my laptop out of the window. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. I think emotions are good in, in uh, every aspect uh, of yeah. life. 
So yeah. I, w- I would go with the emotions. Also, if it's like most of the time it's bad emotions, but I still love playing it. And if I wouldn't have these emotions anymore, I think then uh, I couldn't, I wouldn't play anymore. Mm. Yep. Yeah, I think that would be the concern, right? If you just don't, th- and then it starts to not matter. You don't care, yeah, and then you're not and then it's forward to play or to you want these emotions as well because. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's also uh, I think losing is also a good process of growing up. Yeah. You have to learn to lose because uh, not everything uh, in life is going the way you want. We we know that all. Sometimes you want something, but you you can't get it. And uh, sometimes just things uh, don't go your way, so you have to to handle them. And uh, everybody is doing it in a different way. I'm like, oh, fuck this shit. Yeah. Come <laughs> again. But uh, yeah, I would go with emotions. Emotions are pretty important in life. See, I used to be I used to be a hammer fist guy, but eight eight years ago i've got it pretty under control now man especially with the stream like there's no tilt anymore you know there's a but there's 500 people watching how can you tilt in front of 500 people you got to keep it together you know but i used to throw the hammer fist and then in the very beginning i went for the side hammer fist because i was right beside a, beside a wall and i busted a hole in my wall once dude and i was so embarrassed <laughs> i never did it again i was just like this is silly dude you broke a wall because of a bad beat in a twenty-two dollar tournament, like get it together, you know? Yeah, it's get better it to, to to break the wall than uh, to break your hand. So exactly, you, you were lucky in this spot. <laughs> you lost uh, a huge hand, but you were lucky that you didn't break your hand. <laughs> so better to break the wall. So let's let's return a little bit to earlier in your in your poker career again, because I like. Oh, yeah. Asking advice for the people out there listening, they're avid poker players, you know, maybe they aspire to become pro or they want to get better uh, alongside their normal career. So yes. as as you're sort of climbing the ranks, was there a breakthrough moment to where, okay, this is a doable thing for me as a career, like I can make enough money? Uh, and then to follow up, what do you think was the biggest mistake you made prior to that or during that time that that held you back from getting there? Um, I wouldn't say it was a moment that changed everything. Maybe it was a short time uh, period, like two or three months where I just realized, okay, it's going now better. And then, you know, if it, if it runs better, you play better. But um, like I said, not, not a special moment, but uh, when I was 25, I moved from Vienna to Innsbruck. That's like a four hour drive to play okay. handball there for another team. And uh, that was also the time I invested more time uh, into kind of studying you know it was not like these days you just have a server and you can look up everything like 15 years ago it was just talking with other people and making up your mind and uh, do what you think is best yeah but uh, if i if i would have to give an advice it would be like two big advices never play too high like bankroll management is the most important thing i think mm-hmm. and the second thing is uh, don't drink and play poker That's right that's like huge because I used to like everyone who is 19, 20, you know, have one beer, have two beer during a session. Mm. And then sometimes you end up with having five beer. And, uh, yeah, I realized late that, uh, that was like a huge mistake because, uh, everything changes under kind of drugs like alcohol. Yeah. So bankroll management and uh, no drinking during poker is like i mean of course now these days if i have a final table and i'm one tabling then i'm having a glass of wine but you get my point yes absolutely and also like i made a a few mistakes like always the same one i played too too high like yeah i was earning i don't know 1500 bucks from (laughs) maybe 1500 bucks from handball and then i played uh nl 400 right you know, yeah I, I started my poker career with playing like 50 cent one euro right that's kind of pretty high when uh when you don't have that uh that when you don't have any brain crawl you know mm-hmm. so yeah I, I went to tough times during 20 and 22 but uh i learned of all of my mistakes and yeah and here you are yeah you came out the other side um yeah i I got in a brief from Party Poker. I understand you have satellited into the 10,000 main events uh, from $109. Congratulations on that, by the way. 
you. That's Thank I you. listen. I don't know your bankroll situation, but a 10k is a big shot. So the satellites are a good place to try and uh, to try and give yourself a shot. What happened with that tournament? Give us a little preview here as we're trying to get the word out about the the main event. So how did it go? Okay. Did you get there? Uh, yeah, I, I uh, love to play the 109s for the 1K on Saturday because I think mm. uh, they are really good satellites. And uh, sometimes you you just can have like two times starting stack. You, mm. like it's You have like 25 big blinds at the end and uh, it's like two times starting stack and then you start a satellite with like 200 bigs. Yep. So the jump from the 109 to the 1K because they are running like daily and uh, I love to play them. And uh, then, yeah, how I won the satellite, I was pretty lucky, to be yeah. honest. <laughs> yeah, at one point, like, I don't know, 10 to, 10 to the ticket, I got it in with ace check versus tens and aces. And I rivered the straight or something. So it was a huge pot. Wow. Yeah, I just, yeah so, <laughs> but I love playing satellites. I don't know. Satellites is like one of my favorite things because it's just, fun to you don't have this icm pressure i mean you have it on the bubble of course mm -hmm. but like price jumps everyone gets the same price jump and i think like still a lot of good tournament regs are making a lot of mistakes in satellites yes i i agree i think like you see some plays in satellites and you're you like it just blows my mind you know that people are calling off with like insane hands and we're like six from the money and they're just like ace jack i'll stick it in you know like just below average stack i'm like man you can't go, like you he, can't do that yeah like he has always a ticket you're like blind not blind he's yeah. always true he he has to fold aces yeah you can jam you need to yeah if you're not true and then you jam and then you get caught off by ace 10 and you're like, oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Regular. and then but hammer maybe, fist. <laughs> maybe, maybe they don't like me that much. So they're like, just okay. Yeah. Just let him off. I agree. And you know what's cool as well? The sweat is so fun in satellites. It's such an interesting sweat when you get down to the final three bust outs, got the other tables open. You're like, okay, that guy's going to hit the blind. He's going to be all in blind. This yeah. guy's got three hands to live. And and there's no winner or loser. Everyone wins, and then like one person loses. It's a happy format. It's good. Yeah, <laughs> it's you a happy like format. One guy who is unlucky, but the other guys are lucky. But uh, it takes a lot of um, of focus. If you're playing mm -hmm. like on Sunday, especially if there are like let's say 50 tickets, and you're pretty short, uh, it's pretty tough to to time it because sometimes you really have just to fold your hands and you you blind down to one ante, you yep. still make it because it doesn't matter if you have like hundred picks or, or zero point one. So satellites are a good thing because uh, I think not not that many people make content from satellites. Yes, I don't. Uh, I've never made content regarding satellites but uh yeah i understand everybody gets the same price so just stay in the tournament and don't bust well and i, th I think one of the things that's great that party poker does which isn't favorable for guys like us that might be able to take advantage but for the average player is that you can only win your seat into the target event you can't farm tournament dollars and tickets like you can on other sites so that you have yes. only satellite players that are grinding it like you yep. you have a wide variety of people that are actually trying to get into the target events which allows that format to be so great and profitable so which good. also makes the, uh, the format uh, better and softer because if like let's say 10 15 good regs already have their ticket you're not playing the satellite anymore so it's yep. better for the recognition players uh, it's, uh, it's a higher chance because uh, as i said these uh, these good regs are already qualified and yeah, I love that. I also love it that you are just the max late rig is twenty bigs. I don't like like on other sides. I don't want to talk bad about other sides, but I don't see the point to reg a satellite with big five big blinds. You know, it's yeah, just I think it ruins the game a little bit because then it's just like really luck. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, I like that. You talk about creating content. I have you ever streamed before? Do you, do you make YouTube videos? You want to write a book, anything like that? Or are you just ab about the playing and then mm -hmm. sort of being an ambassador for the site while you play? Yeah, and I'm um, also like a team of No Limit Gaming. Mm. 
right uh, I don't know, uh, if you're familiar with it uh, that's a group of like pretty pretty good poker players Steffen Schildhabe yeah uh, major group yeah we are going also more into the counter-strike uh, counter-strike and poker thing and right. uh, I was I was streaming uh, a few times for for NLG also for party poker but honestly I prefer to play off stream because I just can play more tables it's uh, a more pressure situation for everyone who is playing on stream i guess you know that uh, best yeah. so if if people or friends uh, are watching generally if somebody is watching you it's it's different you know yes absolutely people judge you i don't like being judged i i shouldn't give a, about it but uh it's it's just a, a more pressure situation but on the other end it's it's nice if you have a, a deep run and uh, the chat is going crazy that's yeah. a cool thing you know if more if people are motivating you and people are cheering for you and people can just watch you know and you explain something i like it to give something like back you know i i don't know like gto i'm not a 100 percent gto player of course i've tried mm. but uh, to give the thoughts to especially to low stacks grinders uh, it's a cool thing i think yep awesome so i guess uh, occasionally you can catch up joseph there on the uh, the nlgg stream occasionally i mean let I, us I know I, I will stream again send out so a tweet we... when you're going live for the people man so so we can uh, we can find out i will uh, do that <laughs> so let's Just talk about when you are not streaming i, I would stream Okay, perfect. Right now, is, that's about it. <laughs> um, so let's talk about something we can't do at the moment, which is a little bit of travel. I know you've played some live poker. You've had some decent success with live poker. Uh, and I understand you enjoy traveling. So I want, I want some career highlights. Where are your favorite stops in the world to go play poker? And then also, just as a human being, poker side, where are your favorite places to go travel? My favorite uh, city after Vienna in the world is Melbourne. Like mm. that's for sure. It's just the combination with playing there, you know, it's pretty cold in Europe in yep. January. So Melbourne is like my, my favorite spot for poker. Mm. Also, I, uh, I love uh, the Bahamas. Yes. Like we were last year, it was a, a, a the Hyatt Hotel is also a really nice place, and uh, it's just you know it's still cold in Europe in November, and you can go there. You have the beach. I'm more the, the sun guy, you know. I don't like it if it's like I could never live in in England or somewhere because it's just uh, too much yeah. rain for me, and too cold. So don't do that, man. Overcloud, yeah. <laughs> no, overcast. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Australia is like my, my favorite spot, and I would uh, go for Bahamas. Um, I also like Vegas. Right. I know a lot of people don't like Vegas, but uh, Vegas is for me working six weeks and then we can enjoy the summer. So mm. the games are such like the best games in the world. So Vegas is also one of my favorite spots. And uh, I would go with Barcelona. Barcelona is one of my, my favorite cities. It's, it's amazing. Just, like, I love Barcelona. Yeah. How great. And I love like, the Spanish language. It's so nice. It sounds so, I don't know. Span Spain is like really nice. But uh, outside of poker, my favorite uh, country is New Zealand. Right. Okay. Yes. Because the nature there is just breathtaking. We used uh, like the last two or three years uh, after the Aussie Millions, um, I went uh, to New Zealand for three weeks with uh, five other friends. We booked the uh, free campers and then we drove just like three weeks, went for hikes, mm. chilled, and it's just the best time of the year for me. Do you ever think you'll you'll move to that part of the world? If you like Australia, New Zealand, do you ever think about like uh, saying goodbye to Europe or is, is Austria home? Vienna is home. Yeah. What about Vienna? <laughs> Vienna is a poker mecca. All of the best players in the world are just in Vienna doing their thing, like yeah, developing the newest uh, strats. Why? What is it about Vienna or the Austrian mentality? Like, what has led to the success of? Uh, first of all, um, there are no taxes to play in poker here. Mm -hmm. That's uh, probably a big thing, especially for the German guys. 
the situation in Germany is different. And uh, yeah, Vienna is like, it's pretty central in Europe. You have uh, a lot of history, you have nice parks, uh, everything. And uh, I love it that everyone is here. We have such a nice community here. Like, as you said, for me, best players in the world are like living in Vienna. Like I really respect all the German German guys and to became friends with them and uh, was also like a part of me just getting better. You know, if you talk to, I don't know, Steffen Sondheimer uh, about poker hands, uh, it just makes you better. And uh, mm. you always have the opportunity to do something. You know, there are like 50 to 100 poker players in Vienna. So everyone has time at some point. So you have, uh, you can do every day something with the guys like I don't know, two hours before now, we went uh, to play basketball, like with Ole Shemion, Thomas Müller, everyone was there. And it's just, right. uh, it's just also nice because uh, the guys are really down to earth, you know? Mm -hmm. Everyone saying, it doesn't matter if you play like super high stakes or if you play low stakes, they accept everyone. And uh, that's what I, what I like about the community in Vienna. But Vienna for me is, is home. I'm born here, I'm raised here. It's just uh, for me the place to to be. I was thinking if I would move, I would go to Melbourne. Because, Melbourne, right? Mel because Melbourne is kind of it's kind of similar to Vienna. It's a, a little bit more. You have a little bit more space in Melbourne, I think. Right. And it's close to New Zealand, which is also nice. But uh, it's far away from family and friends, so. Yeah. yeah, Melbourne. Is, uh, like, if I'm, if I, if everything goes how I want, I will stay forever in Vienna. I hope so. <laughs> I honestly, dude, I'm so romantic about uh, Vienna because I, I spent some time in Europe, right? I wanted to go to Europe, spend some time, just broaden my horizons, and it was like Vienna is the poker meme at this point. You know, you think of like great poker grinders come from a city. It's Vienna. So I was like, okay, well, I'll just go to Vienna. Like, maybe I'll become a, a poker sicko. Like, maybe I'll just be playing the high stakes. So I went there, and I was a really big travel fish. Like, I had so much to learn. I never tried the underground. I just walked around everywhere. Didn't get into the coffee scene. Like, I missed so much. So I, I feel like I need to go back. For any other poker tourists out there that might want to get a taste of what's going on with the, with the sickos in, in Germany and Austria, What's, what's your advice to someone visiting Vienna? What, what's the go-to? They have to check it out to get a sense for what it means to be there. That's the thing about Vienna. It's, it's not just one big thing uh, you can see here. It's like so many, so many small things. It's just the city at all. You know, you have the inner mm. city with a lot of history. You have the Stevens Dome, really famous church. Uh, in Europe, like everyone is uh, visiting, and then uh, you have uh, you have like some kind of Disneyland in 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 Vienna, like in a smaller uh, smaller way. Mm -hmm. There is nothing, I would say. Oh, that's it. It's the nightlife. It's the day life. Uh, Vienna is such good connected. Like you don't need a car. You can go everywhere with the underground you should try that <laughs> next yes. time next time and, i will <laughs> uh, you have so many nice uh, bars uh, you have so many nice uh, like uh, coffee shops uh, where you can go and have a, a coffee during the day or a nice lunch like you have you just have have it all but there is not one single point i could say okay this is a must right for vienna so I'm jealous, dude. I love it. I love it so much. I'm so romantic about, about this that. This is an official invitation. If you come, we have a, a, a place you can uh, hang out here. And uh, then I show you around a little bit to Vienna in Vienna. Amazing, dude. I would I will be back 100%. I will be back there. I'd love yeah, that. Because we have to like get over this Corona stuff. And then uh, hopefully uh, everything gets uh, back to normal. When do you think we will be playing live poker? When do you think it's going to be like normal yeah i asked uh, i asked myself that question uh, the question a lot of times in the last uh, two three months i hope it's gonna be maybe march next year probably uh, like there is some hope that the aussie millions 
um, that they will play the Austin Millions, but uh, I think I think they're gonna gonna have Austin Millions, but probably just with Australian players. Yeah, right. Um, I don't know. It's it's pretty tough to say, man. The situation like in the US is uh, kind of pretty fucked up. Uh, Europe is like you know nobody really knows. You just yeah. know what's like in the news. So, what do you think? Yeah, I I think it'll continue to phase uh, towards being good news, but I I don't think the world is going to fully return to like full numbers in tournaments until a vaccine. And I really don't know how long that'll take. But like for me, you know, I I have asthma, so like I'm not I'm not going to really risk it and go to a live event at the moment. No you offense on anyone that does, but like I would yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's just like for me, I don't I don't really want to risk it. So I'm just gonna wait till there's a vaccine. I'm gonna grind online at party poker and like good to go. Um, so I think I think you're right. I would say like March, April, kind of is when hopefully we have something medical to help out. I don't know. It just seems right. That's yeah. fingers we'll crossed. The sooner the better. I, have you I, been coping okay? Or like are you, are you tilting about it, or or have you been fine through the whole thing and just like keep on? Why tilting? You can uh, things you cannot change. You have to ex accept. So yeah. that's what I've learned. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what I try to learn, let's say it in that way. Right. So no, actually, I think it was kind of for the poker scene. It was not that bad at the beginning because like every guarantee got smashed. Like mm. March, April, it was like a lot of traffic, and uh, we are like the only scene. I think it was good for like good. But um, for myself, it's just starting to be annoying. Like yes. I want to play live tournaments. I want to travel. I want to meet friends I don't see every day. Like it's nice to have the German community here. But I like during the years you make so many friends. Uh, you just see a poker stop, and it's always a nice time, you know, to hang out with uh, not always with the same people. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and I love traveling. I miss it so much. Yeah. The good thing is you save a lot of money because you don't have to travel that much. Yeah, exactly. I've been living on the cheap too, man. It's just like, well, you know, yeah. there's money's you're piling home, up. You're grinding. <laughs> that's it, basically. So. Yeah, that's it. Joseph, I want to thank you so much for taking the time. It's been a pleasure to speak with you. Uh, and I think really insightful for people that are listening to learn some stuff, learn about you. Uh, where can people follow your poker career? They want to know what's going on with Joseph. Twitter, are you social media at all? You know, do you blog what? Twitter is like, I am on Twitter, but I, I think I made two tweets, three tweets, maybe. Probably not <laughs> no, the spot. <laughs> I don't know. Twitter is, uh, I, I prefer Instagram. Like if you, okay. if you want to follow my, I'm not posting that much private stuff. It's more like a poker account. But when I'm, I used to travel, I did post a lot because I like sharing like nice stuff. Because if you, if I see someone who is like, I don't know, at, at a beautiful place, I will check out the place and uh, maybe I want to go as well. Mm. But uh, yeah, I'm trying to to give more more private stuff also away. But uh, honestly, for me, it's always this this filming of myself. It's kind of awkward. Yeah, yeah. it's weird. I'm trying to get used to it, but it's always you know <laughs> if I have to make a story for let's say a party, a giveaway. It looks like, okay, this is the first try, but actually I'm trying it 15 times and uh, because yeah. I, I just feel a little bit awkward filming myself, but uh, it's just the thing I have to get used, yeah. used to it. So yeah, if you want to follow me on Instagram, that's What's my, the tag? What's the tag? At? It's like, at, it's like Josinho. J-O-Z-I-N-H-O. Yeah, and then like an under, what do you say? Like a Underscore. Space. Yeah. Underscore, yeah, and uh, JS for there it is. The editors can put it on the screen here, nice and big. I want at least ten new followers, okay? People listening, at I least ten. Ten new followers, that would be great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks for taking the time, man. I appreciate it. No worries. I thank you, and uh, see you at the tables. And stop free betting me, please. <laughs> okay. Big thanks to Joseph for taking the time, uh, man. I just, I just get so excited about that life, dude, in Austria. I just love it so much, and I can tell in the way that he speaks and his friends and everything. I just think he's really got it going on. But uh, 
really an interesting conversation. Uh, a very well-spoken guy. So I enjoyed that. And I know all of you did as well. So thanks to Joseph for taking the time and coming on the podcast. But before I let you all go, we've got to do our hashtag JS Poker Hero competition where we're going to give two of you, two of you, $109 satellite tickets. I just decided that off the fly. I think that's good. $218 in uh, in free money for listening to this podcast. I think that's about right. All you have to do to win a ticket is answer this question on Twitter using the hashtag JSPokerHero uh, and use the hashtag as well, WPTWOC, okay? And the question is going to be, how many chips am I going to take through to day two of the mini main event, the $1,050 buy-in? Now, if I don't make it through, which I'm not accepting as a possibility, but if I don't make it through, we're going to choose two people at random. But if I do make it through, the two closest guesses in chips through to day two are going to win a $109 ticket. Thank you all so much for taking the time this week. I hope you enjoyed it. If you're watching on YouTube, like, comment, and subscribe. iTunes, leave a review and a rating if you wouldn't mind. And Spotify, follow along and do your Spotify thing. Say so much for taking the time, but until next week, we'll see you later. <laughs>